Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about the important role botanical gardens play in plant conservation and in strengthening communities at large with guests. Bruce Harkey, President and CEO of the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Columbus, Ohio. Maureen Heffernan, uh, Executive Director of Myriad Botanical Gardens and Scissortail Park and Arboretum. And Mary Pat Matheson, the President and CEO of the Atlanta Botanical Garden in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited to be here to talk about botanical gardens and how, it, how these, these wonderful gardens bring nature, bring our, our plant life into urban settings and, and, uh, and provide a way for uh, human beings to really reconnect with nature. And, you know, when I, when I think of botanical gardens, and I grew up with botanical gardens, um, I do admit that I think about the pretty flowers, right? Um, botanical gardens are so much more. So uh, let's just go around the room and, and give everyone's take on really the importance of botanical gardens, both on the scientific aspect and the conservation aspect, but also the pure enjoyment. So, Bruce... Would you like to uh, kick us off uh, 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 um, uh, of your experience, the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Columbus? Thank you. Yeah, so we are located in Columbus, Ohio, and we were, we were established in 1993. So we're a relatively new botanic garden. Um, we own 40 acres, and we sit adjacent to 48 acres of public space. So it's kind of a unique uh, business model in the botanical garden world. And our mission is, of course, inspired by horticulture. We elevate quality of life in the community and we connect uh, the community through educational, cultural and social experiences. Um, I think uh, when I think about the conservatory, it has maybe two faces. The first face is we're a major tourist attraction in Columbus, Ohio. We um, are now the number one attraction. Um, thank you to uh, the fact that we were one of the few organizations that was open. And I think people during the pandemic really felt such great relief and therapeutic benefits from being able to come to the conservatory and be outside and enjoy all of our exhibitions and horticultural offerings. And then we're also a very important community resource. We are, are very focused on community outreach and education and have developed uh, comprehensive access programs to make sure that every member of our community has the ability to come to the conservatory and enjoy all the therapeutic benefits of being in nature. And Maureen, you have some breaking news to share with us, hot off the presses, right? It is. Well, um, uh, I'm at Myriad Gardens here in Oklahoma City. And uh, in September 2019, uh, we opened a new park called Scissortail Park. It's a 70 acre downtown park. It's the poster child of a project for urban renewal and, and innovative urban planning thinking. It was an old derelict, awful, think of the worst urban blight and that was this 70 acres. And we opened half of it, um, 36 acres, and uh, we applied for Arboretum status because we really want this project to be a hybrid model of wonderful, innovative urban park, and yet also a serious Arboretum and botanical garden. But we have almost a thousand trees. We plan to add more. So we're going to use this park not only for recreation and cultural events, but as a place where people can come and see all of these trees that are especially selected to thrive and be beautiful here in a very challenging climate in Oklahoma City. And so we can encourage urban greening as well. So that's kind of a, a really interest of mine. What are some new paradigms? What are new models that can be botanical gardens and how they can link up with uh, other types of green spaces to provide the green space and the horticultural um, inspiration and education. You know, you started, Mark, by talking about flowers and beauty, and I want to start there because I think first and foremost, we are about beauty, and the beauty comes mostly in the form of our plants, and I, our plants are as diverse as our audience is, and people come to our gardens to escape the world they may be trying to get away from, and we all know right now, they're trying to escape Zoom. We're trying to get away from Zoom and get out into the garden. Um, and then it, the garden is an opportunity for people to connect with nature where they can't do it at home, perhaps. But it is a place where you can travel to unique parts of the world. So our orchid show is open right now. And today, if you visited the garden, you'd see our tulips in full display, which are just beautiful. 
um, not from this part of the world originally. And then the orchids, you can go see orchids from uh, primarily South Amer America or Madagascar. So we give people an opportunity to leave the lives they're living right now and go explore parts of the world they may never get to see through our plants. And then the other part that I think is so important right now, and I think Bruce said it well, you know, we're really a respite in a difficult time. And we've all seen that. Uh, botanical gardens really are, I think the only field right now in the arts and cultural world that we live in um, that has thrived during this pandemic because we're largely outdoors and safe places to visit. So we haven't suffered like our colleagues in the cultural world have. Um, and here in Atlanta, we've been trying to partner with our cultural partner, our cultural colleagues to work together to try and get everybody out of this pandemic. But it's been good to see our visitors come to the garden and to see them smile, albeit underneath their masks, but they're smiling with their eyes. I find it so interesting, this sort of intersection of, of urban planning and uh, green space and, and uh, botanical gardens. Uh, Maureen, could you just uh, uh, continue to tell the story about how um, this, uh, how Myriad was, was put together? Because it's, it's so interesting how you describe it. You described it as an urban renewal project. So it is not a project of, of simply building a new facility or, or taking a piece of land. It's really about transformation. Um, could you just uh, continue to sort of tell that story and how you are filling that space now with programming? Uh, yes, you know, I, uh, I was working in Maine, in a small town in Maine before I was recruited for this position here. It was the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden. I had been there, oh gosh, eight years or so, mm -hmm. and building up a brand new garden from scratch in a very rural area and happy to say it was very successful. And I got a recruiting call one day and they said, well, we're, we're kind of starting up this garden. We're redoing it and we need somebody. And I said, well, where is it? And they said, Oklahoma. And I said, well, no, thanks. <laughs> Not that I have anything against Oklahoma, but you don't think about moving here. But anyway, they, they convinced me to come out and take a look. And I was so intrigued by the possibilities they were talking about. Uh, Devon Energy is a large oil company right across the street from us. They decided to build a world headquarters and really help the downtown turn around, which really needed it. Uh, they were eligible for about $50 million or so, uh, close to that, in TIF money, tax, in, tax increment financing. And the head of the company is a very civic-minded person and said, let's give this to Myriad Gardens. They're right across the street. It was badly in need of a renovation. And so about 10 years ago, they sunk that amount of money into a relatively small space, 15 acres, and completely transformed it. And they created a public-private partnership with the city. So we are a nonprofit foundation. We get about half of our support, a little less than half, from the city. And then we're also responsible for earning revenues and philanthropic support to balance out our budgets about 4.7 here. And that has gone really well. So as an open access botanical garden, it's, it's been wonderful for the city. So many gardens uh, have gates around them. They charge admission fees for their maintenance, but this model is able to be open access. So that has a lot of exciting upsides to it in terms of accessibility and diversity. We don't have to work as hard as other groups do because anybody can walk on the property. Um, so we've been able to be very creative with our programming. We have a wide vision of what programming can be in addition to our horticulture programming. And that has really activated the downtown. The urban green space has been an incredible quality of life for people. And it also gave people a jolt of, wow, this is so transformative. What else can we do? How can we think really big? And then that was uh, Scissor Tail Park is the next chapter of that. So there's, there's a real power in that. And I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities for these public private partnerships, linking really good urban planning, innovative concepts with green spaces. So we as a botanical garden group how can we be part of that and really rethink some models of how 
new botanical gardens can be created and run and managed with less overhead so they can be open access for all. And, and Bruce, when you think about your work, uh, very often, um, and Maureen was referring to this, uh, Mary Pat also had referred to this uh, before the show, uh, often cultural institutions um, end up uh, not necessarily being embraced by everyone, nor do they uh, in the past, nor have they in the past welcomed everyone uh, into their environs. How do we deal with the uh, issue of welcoming, of embracing, of considering, um, of listening to uh, diverse voices in communities, voices um, not only of wealth, but of poverty, um, uh, families, uh, individuals, young folks. Uh, how do we ensure that we're evolving our institutions so that we are embracing people of all ethnicities, races, sensibilities? Could you talk to that in, in terms of what you're doing uh, over in Columbus? That's a great question. The American Public Gardens Association has been very focused on our industry overall and looking at issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and we have uh, Idea Cafe and lots of discussions during our conference. And when you look around the room in Botanical Gardens, much like a lot of other cultural institutions, they are, uh, they're not reflecting the diversity of our communities. And so that's a real focus in the botan Botanical Garden world, and particularly in Columbus, there is significant income disparity. And so the conservatory has uh, been working on this issue for many years and certainly um, over the last year have really ramped up our efforts. One of the uh, important considerations I think is to ensure that everyone has access. And for us, one of the game changers was the construction of, of many different projects over the last 10 years, about $45 million worth of capital projects, but we built the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation Children's Garden, which is four acres. And if you want to fix the diversity issue in the industry, I think you have to start, just like I was inspired by a visit to Niagara Falls uh, School of Horticulture as a child, everyone in the community has to have that experience. And so it was really important for us to ensure that we have access. So we have community days, a free day every month for everyone who lives in Franklin County. We are part of the Museums for All program, which allows access to both the daytime experience and special events for only $3 a person. We have a partnership with the library where if you have a if you have a library card, you can come to the conservatory after checking out a membership card. So we've really doubled down on our access programs. But that being said, I think the most important thing is to listen to the communities, to go out and be part of the community and make sure that we understand what will make those community members feel welcome when they come to the conservatory. So we're working very hard with our board and staff to do comprehensive training to ensure that everyone has a wonderful experience and that the visit to a botanical garden can become part of the important experiences for their families and friends. Well, it seems we have some challenges uh, before us. We just completed a poll in which we asked whether uh, people had um, visited botanical gardens, and of course it's a select audience, but even in this select audience, um, it basically split a third, a third, a third, um, never visit or rarely visit, uh, maybe once a year and then uh, more than uh, two or three times a year. Um, and so we, we have a market uh, to be addressed. Mary Pat, when you look at the, the challenge of diversity that so many arts uh, and cultural organizations have, it really does start with um, evolving the board, evolving the staff, and evolving the audience. Um, how do you um, attack those three uh, areas that Bruce referred to? So um, we live in a very diverse community in Atlanta, and I think that botanical gardens have a leg up on other arts and cultural institutions um, because we don't have walls. We don't have the barrier of walking into a museum that's intimidating by nature of its design or the walls you walk into and art on the wall that maybe not everyone understands or has been invited to learn about. Everybody, no matter where they come from, has one way or another touched in plant, been in, you know, involved in gardening, grandmother taught them the garden. And so I think we are, we're it's not as challenging for us as it is for other institutions. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't have to work hard. We do have to do that. And, you know, the number one thing is welcoming. You said the word really well. 
everyone needs to feel like they're a part of the organization and the place that they're visiting. And that means when they come to see the garden, they need to see people who look like them. And so that's where you talk about staff. We need diverse staff. We need staff that come with all um, different perspectives about the world that we live in, because that's just how we all thrive together. Um, and, and we, you know, we have over 800,000 visitors a year in a normal year. And um, so we spend a lot of money on marketing and learning, you know, where people are coming from. And, and so we invest in the communities that we want to come here. Atlanta is um, a very robust African-American community. And uh, it's so important to be a part of that community and welcoming and um, uh, more than half of our visitation is, are people of color. Um, whether African American, Asian, Hispanic, um, and then all the languages that are here. So we work hard to make sure our staff represent the people who visit. But I think being welcoming, I think um, making sure that your staff and board look like the people who you want to come visit. Um, we're all of us doing DEI work right now, and that's opening our eyes to how much more can be done. So uh, this isn't the beginning, nor is it the end. There's a lot more to be done. But um, what we saw last year, particularly, and, and already this year, is that um, because we closed the garden for two months, like everybody did, when we reopened it, we were going to stagger the number of people we could have per hour in order to control crowds. The only way we were going to make the numbers we need to make budget or even come close is to extend our hours. So we opened every night uh, till nine o'clock, at least May through October. And we do a program called Cocktails in the Garden that we're well known for. And one thing we've learned, I don't care who you are, if you're over 21, you like a cocktail for the most part. So um, we, we brought in different wines and beers and cocktails that people can enjoy. And we're taking what worked last year into this year and bringing music in. That is music, whether it's jazz or blues or country western, we're gonna have music here every night. Um, because it's a safe place to visit in the as we wrap up this pandemic, which I think I see that the end is in sight. And there are just so many different ways to break these barriers that have been created over the decades down and to really create a more fully integrated botanical garden where everyone in the community. You're creating a social space. Uh, incidentally, Kenneth Kutchman gave us um, uh, a uh, a gentle chiding because we should all have plants in the background for this uh, for this discussion. So, Kenneth, thank you very much. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll correct. If, if I could, if I could add to what uh, Mary Pat just said, I mean, I think what's so interesting that we're all working for diversity and bringing in groups of people that haven't normally visited in large numbers. But that's where I think the interesting um, deeper question may be is what when not not all of them, but Many botanical gardens started as old estates right. or you know, wealthy folks and they, they, be, they became botanical gardens um, or where other ones that didn't have that background, they're, they're in parks or they're in quote, nice neighborhoods for the most part, not all of them. But that's where I think, I mean, why not build a new kind of botanical garden in an inner city area that is in a highly African-American neighborhood or Hispanic or low income or the groups that we're trying to welcome in, what would that look like? Um, what would an open access garden look in that neighborhood? Um, to me, that's, that's what I would like to see our organizations thinking about because linking up with some public private partnerships and that, that those would be kind of things to start from scratch. And if the community helped planned it, what does that design look like? And I think that would really help address that issue in an interesting way. No, you're, you're pointing out something, Maureen, which is so important. It's the shift of in power, right? And, and the, um, the idea of, of inclusive sensibility um, that might change the models in, in really substantial ways. We see it with uh, Greenbelt alliances throughout the United States, where citizens are basically saying, I want green near me. I don't want to be in the middle of a, of a brown field or a food desert, right? And, and alliances come up um, from neighborhoods. Um, I, I have another question, which is sort of related to this in terms of the urban environment. 
you know, there's a big dialogue today about uh, climate change and, and global warning, uh, warming and, and energy and urban planning. And the pandemic has really shown uh, some of our vulnerabilities uh, in, in that respect, in terms of our infrastructure to, to uh, conduct business remotely, or in terms of how restaurants have moved to outdoor dining in order to, uh, as, a, as a way to uh, change the environment to make it more safer. But also we're finding that maybe that, that might be uh, more enjoyable. Uh, Bruce, how are you interacting with your city planning um, officials and, and discussing things like uh, greening your, your urban environments uh, using your uh, garden as an example, as a hub of that type of a dialogue? You know, just last week, I was part of a, uh, a discussion with the city. Uh, one of the city council members ho hosted a public dialogue about climate change. And so the conservatory is a member of that, that committee. And one of the interesting discussions that we had is the intersection of climate change and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because underserved neighborhoods typically have a, a reduced tree canopy and higher levels of pollution. And so I think that's a really important issue for us to address. For the conservatory, um, we have taken the approach in educating the public, being the place where those conversations can be convened in a safe space. And then secondly, um, you, you know, if, you, if you hosted a seminar about climate change, uh, it's fraught with political peril, but also I'm not sure how many people would come. You'd have the the people who are very passionate about it. The approach that we've used is through art exhibitions, through, uh, for, for example, the Wetland Explorer experience in the children's garden. We're using our exhibitions and our plant collections, including blooms and butterflies to talk about environmental issues. So we hook the public initially, and then once they're there, we can take the opportunity to educate them. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity um, for botanical gardens to play an important role. And I'm gonna shift my camera to show some plant material outside temporarily for those of you who need some green space. <laughs> Wonderful. That doesn't look like Ohio. It's uh, Palm Springs. That's what I thought some palm trees out there. <laughs> so we just completed another uh, survey and we asked what kind of experience is most important. Oh, just lost it. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, Mary Pat, um, same question to you. You know, everything is so uh, fraught with politics. It seems to me that um, having a discussion about uh, the fact that we're all being uh, impacted by uh, climate change is, is, is just a matter of, of uh, being practical. Let's, let's talk about how we deal with it. Um, Bruce's approach is to basically finesse the, 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 the topic, to talk about uh, real problems. Bruce, I hope I'm not uh, um, putting words in your mouth, but talk about uh, real problems that people face uh, every day um, and and uh, uh, not deal with with the overarching question in order to uh, to uh, avoid the politics. Um, how do you face these types of issues of thing of issues like uh, diversity or issues like um, the whole issue of, of global warming warming where uh, questions that should be discussed end up becoming uh, so fraught with political, uh, meaning that, that they can't be discussed. You know, I think there's no question climate change still has a political overture to it, but I think that ship has sailed. I think no matter what community you live in in the United States, you've been impacted by climate change. You know, whether it's, I can now grow camellias in Maryland where I couldn't as a kid to, um, you know, we just had you know an epic storm to whatever it is. So, if uh, recent polling shows that 70% of Americans know climate change is real. So we have to step away from the politics and talk about the science. And, you know, I'm happy to say for the first time, just starting January, really, when we got a new president, that we can talk about science again. And the vaccine is a great example of the amazing nature of science today and how strong it is and how, uh, how perhaps poised we may be to start solving some of the bigger problems that are before us. Gardens with respect to climate change, to me, the story is not about, you know, we can tell our guests what to do by demonstrating that we're recycling and that we're 
using renewable energy and that we're being efficient with plants that we purchase, that we're not showcasing plants that require a lot of fertilizer and pesticides. So there are so many stories woven into climate change that we can tell and tell well. And none of those have to talk about politics. They just talk about science, good horticulture, good gardening and common sense. So that's one way to look at it. The other to me is the loss of biodiversity, which is tied to climate change and also tied to development is perhaps the greatest issue that we in our field really face. And you know, you may not know this Mark, but for us telling people why plants are important is number one, it begins there. That people in our communities don't know why plants are important. The federal government, so if you think about any endangered animal, butterfly, the monarch, whatever you want to talk about, each of those species is necessitated to have a plant to survive, right? Plants are the habitat for all these endangered species, but yet no one, there's no word plant in habitat. So we forget that plants are really critical to all life. And that's the story we have to tell, to get people to understand the importance of plants, selecting right plants, celebrating plants, and um, protecting plants because um, from the American chestnut that disappeared in the 1940s to the hemlock, to the ashes that are disappearing in our country because of endanger or invasive species, we need to tell those stories. Maybe they're more relevant than climate change, but they're all tied together. So to me, it starts with plants, it starts with science, and then sometimes you have to be good natured about it and have some fun with it. So for instance, here in Atlanta, um, we want to talk about science and we want people to understand about plants and climate change. So about four years ago, we started Science Cafe and we do it during cocktails in the garden. And it always starts with a cocktail con concoction because you can't have a drink that didn't come from a plant originally. And that's just kind of the fun of it. And then we go into the science and have different um, professors and scientists from across the, the country and, and in some cases around the world talk about the work they're doing relevant to plants and ecology and the climate change. And it's now that we're doing the Zoom, we can do it so much more. What? It's subtly educational, isn't it, right? You're, you're bringing together the education side and the enjoyment side, right? Yeah, you know what we call it in Atlanta? Stealth education. So oh, we just you learn while you have fun. We just completed uh, uh, two polls, interesting results. Um, we asked what kind of experience is most important to your understanding of conservation. And 57% uh, said visits to parks and wild places. And then we had uh, a few that said uh, uh, programming and then botanical gardens specifically separate from parks and wild places. And then we also completed another poll, which is what are the most important programs or services offered by botanical gardens and conservatories? You'll be interested to hear that Providing an oasis of nature within urban settings uh, received the greatest number of votes, but we also received pretty significant numbers of votes for education and training, as well as uh, preserving plant diversity. So we have this sort of confluence of, of, of interest. Um, I'd like to uh, go once more around the room because we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, Bruce, we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Maureen, and then Mary Pat. If if you were uh, going to um, describe your most important programs and future initiatives um, in, in each of your botanical gardens. Uh, uh, for Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Columbus, Bruce, what would you cite as your most important um, uh, initiatives and, uh, and plans for this next uh, year or two years? I think it's, um, it's what you mentioned earlier. I think it's listening to the community. And so um, one of the initiatives that we are working hard at is to, to rejuvenate our neighborhood advisory committee, which um, has representatives from all the communities in Columbus to listen uh, and hear what they would like to see at the botanical garden. And that's an important step as we envision the North Star for the conservatory for the next 25 years. I think for us, the next big step is focusing on world-class botanical gardens. We have some beautiful gardens. The Children's Garden is a great example of that. We have amazing plant collections, um, but taking that next step to create kinetic, accessible, immersive, and distinctive gardens that are consistent with our brand experience that are welcoming for the entire community is an important next step for the conservatory. And it's, a, it's all about families and children. We have an amazing intersection when you look at the demographics of the, the baby boomers retiring who are grandparents, 
and the millennials having children who are very passionate about environmental issues and about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What a rare opportunity for botanical gardens to rise to the challenge and play an important role in moving society forward. So, so important, Maureen, I see you um, disagreeing vociferously, right? <laughs> right. You know, I've, I've been influenced. I've been listening lately to um, Professor Sandel out of Harvard. He's famous for this justice course in the sense of the common good and the debate around that and, and why we need that for democracy, quality of life, and, and all these things that our country needs to reinforce. And I, I just see the, the most important thing I think I can do at Myriad Gardens and especially Scissor Tail Park is maintain them exquisitely, great programming, free as much as possible to demonstrate the, the quality of life transformation of places, the sense of the common good, uh, a square where people mix, they want to mix and come together. But I think that to show that people can do big projects in these partnerships that uh, will address big issues. So, so that they will approve funding, whether it's tax dollars or philanthropic, to, to continue the momentum of creating these successful, wonderful green spaces and new types of botanical gardens. I think demonstrating you can think big, do things that people trust and invest in, that keeps things going and the momentum builds and that can address big issues from climate change to um, quality of life and diversity and all of that. It's really the relationship that you're forging with, with your community, isn't it? it? It's building trust and confidence and excitement. So they want to keep, keep the ball rolling with these big projects that can really transform lives and communities. And perhaps with, with trust and involvement and listening, uh, some of the barriers that you were referring to, Mary Pat, uh, can be broken down, right? Uh, and, and what are the, uh, Mary Pat, uh, we're gonna let you have the last word. What are the major initiatives uh, for you in Atlanta going forward over the next year or two years? Well, you know, all of what we've just been talking about for sure, but, but um, our plant conservation program is really going to the next level. And it's like anything, you do it through partnerships. So uh, we partner with five or six universities, Emory, Georgia Tech, UGA, um, other universities as well, Spelman here in Atlanta. And, and so a part of our conservation program that's really beginning to blossom and grow that I think is so essential to the future is the work we're doing with interns and um, undergraduate students and pretty soon postgraduate students. So that we can bring the next generation of plant conservationists and botanists to the field. Um, universities have lost botany, they've lost the life sciences, they've gone molecular. We as botanical gardens can help replace that. And universities are looking for those partnerships. And part of this um, program that we're doing is also focused on diversity. And it tends to be young women right now coming out of university, um, young African-American women coming to learn about the science of conservation and work with us in the field. So I can see that science is gonna change dramatically in the next decade because we're gonna have diversity in the sciences and, and in the life sciences, we're not going to lose botany and ecology because if you don't know where your plants come from, you won't know where your new medicines are coming from. So the work we're doing there is very important. And then we're hosting the um, Global Magnolia Consortium, which is, we have people from almost every uh, country in the world represented, uh, particularly a lot in, in South America where there are so many magnolias that are endangered, but also Asia. And uh, you know, learning how to Zoom has been a really big deal for our conservation team because now we have uh, people who can translate and we can do meetings, three hour meetings with people on different continents working together to solve the problem of how we preserve these magnolias and grow them and also find ways working with other partners um, to build economies in the communities which these plants live in uh, that don't require farming and some of the destructive practices that have happened over the years. So I think saving plants and saving people are linked together and I'm excited about that. Such an important point, uh, Bruce, you made the point about um, connecting to society, Maureen uh, as well, this whole idea of 
How do you communicate with your audience? How do you change the world by changing yourself? Has been part of, of this discussion. Uh, Bruce Hart, the president and CEO of the Franklin Park Conservatory at Botanical Gardens in Columbus. Maureen Heffernan, executive director of Myriad Botanical Gardens and Scissor Tail Park and Arboretum in Oklahoma City, and Mary Pat Matheson, President and CEO of the Atlanta Botanical Garden in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much for sharing your work, the work of your staffs, your boards, your communities. Thank you for contributing to a stronger civil society here in America. Uh, that's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you. Those who ask uh, questions, thank you so much. It helps me during the interviews. I cannot say stay safe. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Take care. Mm -hmm.